sound that I make at the piano when my finger touches the key, that sound will touch a very intimate part of the people who are listening, the eardrum. You don't get to touch eardrums. You know, that's dangerous, but a musician can. Welcome to Zestful Aging, where I talk with fascinating, talented, and influential guests who reflect on the adventures and challenges of aging and who are living their lives with vibrance and purpose. I'm your host, Nicole Christina, psychotherapist, writer, and Zestful Ager. And if you like this podcast, you'll love my companion course, Zestful Aging, Simple and Sustainable Habits for Health and Longevity. You'll have access to what I've learned from being a psychotherapist for 30 years and the latest research on what habits really matter and contribute to vibrant aging. Find out more at NicoleChristina.com. Last week, we spoke with Giada Storman, who's the tennis champion from Canada and the U.S. and the model of resilience. She just put a new book out called On the Ball, which is for recreational tennis players, and it's really excellent. I would recommend it highly. Next week, we're going to be speaking with Melissa Burton, who is an Academy Award winner for short documentary. She did a beautiful piece of film on menstrual justice called period end of sentence well i have my jack russell terrier sparky beside me my coffee in my hand so let's begin Today we're speaking with Bill Protzman, whose mission is to raise awareness of the power of music as self-care, especially for vulnerable populations. In addition to being a successful IT entrepreneur, Bill holds magna cum laude degrees in piano performance and creative writing and has concertized and performed for many years with a focus on bringing music to audiences in non-traditional ways. And uh, one of his awards, of many, was the National Council for Behavioral Health, uh, the Award for Excellence. Welcome to the show, Bill. Thank you so much, Nicole. It's so great to be here. So, you know, we've been hearing a lot about self-care in many forms uh, for for a lot of years now. I think it's really uh, coming on to the sort of the public landscape. People realize it's important and that you can't really give from a place of emptiness. But I, I wonder if you could just start talking about how music fits in as an element of self-care. Well, sure. Um I have to be, so I'll admit to my prejudice right away, being a piano player all my life, um, I came by this information rather honestly, but also somewhat more slowly because I had to develop it myself. We haven't had a lot of research on music, you know, the way that we have in the last 10 years, it's just exploded. Mm. So um, I learned what I learned about music. And then later on in the process of some amazing therapy with at least two just incredible therapists and a, a smattering of others <laughs> to be fair uh-huh. right right so it, I, I've learned through the process of life and research and information that's out there what was going on with me as a child as an adolescent as a young adult and how music was connecting me to a, a therapeutic practice that I didn't even realize I was doing it's so silly to say it that way but it, it, it really is true mm. you know musicians know that music is good for us. And we are kind of aware of the ways that that works. But I mean, we've got neuroscientists now using music as a stimulus and functional MRI. We can watch what's happening as music is playing or as people are improvising. That's all fascinating stuff. I mean, it just, Uh, it blows me away. But to be honest, music is way more than what's happening in your brain. And when you play in front of people, you're going to get people in your audience who are falling asleep, who are who are <laughs> coughing, who are thinking about who are checking on their, their Facebook, sp- yeah, yeah, you know. And then there'll be a few people paying attention, and and music is really working on you the whole time. 
And when I say somebody is asleep in a concert, I'm like, oh, thank you, because maybe this is the only time that person can get real rest. Hmm. Right. And, and that may be because of some physiological response they have to the music that they can't help, but it's putting them to sleep. And I've, I've slept through classical music myself. It's really great to do that. I wake up so rested, ah, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and, and I'm also a performer. So I'm the guy on the stage who's putting you to sleep, you know. <laughs> Well, that's great. So if, if that's your response, fantastic. If you're checking your phone, that's great. There's still, you can't help your response to sound and rhythm. I mean, that's so deep within us. We share this with animals, by the way, and even with reptiles, the lizard brain. We often talk about the amygdala as the lizard brain, yes. where our emotions get, you know, spark, where our responses happen. So we have this in common with so much of life. Um, and I'd even venture to say that we live in a resonating universe, you know, it's, it's on, it's off, it's light, it's dark. Uh, and sound is that. A sound that I make at the piano, when my finger touches the key, that sound will touch a very intimate part of the people who are listening, the eardrum. You don't get to touch eardrums. Uh -huh. You know, that's dangerous, but a musician can. And, or just speaking together, we do. So what quality are bringing to that touch? If it's the right kind of touch, well, bless you if it puts you to sleep or if it gives you a creative idea or you know whatever that sound does for you let's let's do that right and allow that to be whatever it is it's just so marvelous to to know the breadth of the sounds and oh by the way you, you know one sound that that we both hear might affect you completely differently than it affects me okay that's fine too let's figure out what those things are and then you can use that sound for what it's necessary for in, in your experience. And I can use the sound, same sound, for whatever it does for me and mine. You mm -hmm. know, create that awareness is so key. So That's cute. so interesting. A few things you said, you know, one, one of uh, the things I've heard lately about podcasting is that it, it, one of the, the reasons it's so powerful is because you are going right in someone's ears, usually with earbuds. I mean, it's like, very close to their brain, yeah. you know, that that intimacy. And it sounds like, you know, that's part of what you're saying is it, it's absorbed in a way that's deep and profound. It is. And one of the things that I do as a self-care advocate with musicians particularly is to help us as a group take responsibility for that touch because it's so powerful. Um, and this would apply to anyone who is a public speaker, to anybody who talks for a living, DJs, you name it. Mm -hmm. If your mm -hmm. goal is communication, the quality of that communication is so key. Uh, and as you've pointed out, I've listened to a lot of podcasts, and there's a style of communication these days that I don't know what to, how to call it or what to generalize it, but it, it's, it's a powerful style. And most of the powerful podcasters s seem to share that style of communication. Um, w someone I can remember uh, from seeing TED Talks who's that way just because that's who he is. And maybe we're all modeling ourselves on, on him is uh, Simon Sinek, mm -hmm. The Power of Why. Yes. Uh, he has that kind of speech pattern. Uh, Tim Ferriss has that speech pattern. There are others out there that, that have that ability to be very convincing without being very powerful. They just are able to do that beautiful communication that, that gets right through. Mm -hmm. It's a, a real it, skill. It's, a, it's such a skill. I mean, we were talking earlier about, wait, wait, don't tell me. And you can think of the guests and the hosts who are on that show and who has a powerful communication skill and style and, and who doesn't. And that contrast is very important. We need to have contrast so we understand what's what. But you'll, mm -hmm. if you pay attention to that, like you were pointing out, uh, and listeners, if you're listening, take your favorite hosts, whether on the radio or podcasts, and see what they have in common, and start to learn about why they're so power, why their voice has that that beautiful quality of connecting with you versus anybody else that you talk to. It's 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 music. It's now you're talking. Are you talking about sort of the the quality of the actual voice, like how melodic it is, or what octave? Is that what we're talking about here? Well, it can be that. You know those beautiful sort of Walter Cronkite voices. Mm. That's a different quality than than uh, Simon Sinek, as long as we're talking about him. Um, mm -hmm. But they're equally effective. It's like learning to bring the right kind of tone to a piece of music. If it's a happy piece, you want to bring a different energy to that than if it's a sad piece. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, 
the quality of the tone that you get is very important in being accurately uh, and accurately representing those emotions. So you're you talking about being attuned to your yes. um, maybe your guest or whoever you're speaking with being attuned so the tone matches the mood. Something like that. The topic. I'm I mean, let's in our podcast, for example. So you've explained who your audience is, and I can hear from your voice how you go about talking to them. So somehow, in some way, um, I need to fit into that so that there's a uh, not a complete mirror, but a, a complementary flavor in the room, mm -hmm. right? And. That means I'm not going to come on this podcast and start yelling and screaming, <laughs> <laughs> right? That would be obvious. But there may be ways that, um, that just the sound of what we have to communicate syncs up that reach some listener at a level that they're not aware of. But if it weren't done properly, would cause that listener to go elsewhere, to turn us off and, and find something else to listen to. And I, I think when you listen to the real pros out there, um, Radio Lab is a favorite of mine. Mm -hmm. um, you can hear how that all seamlessly blends together. And even though the voices sound different, they have this, this harmony about them that mm -hmm. works. Mm -hmm. Like different notes on the same instrument, but they all fit together so beautifully. Different horns in the orchestra or you know, instruments in the band. It, Some confluence. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful thing. Well, you've you've experienced it. We all have experienced this when we work mm -hmm. well together with somebody. We just work well. It does. There's, how do you explain that? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a skill you can develop, right? You know, it's interesting. As a therapist, I'll often find myself mirroring the body uh, language or the posture of a client, and unconsciously, and you just say, "Oh, we're both doing the exact same thing." And I think that that's similar to what you're talking about—that you're somehow in sync. Yes, yes. So um, a, a wonderful thing that happens on the radio all the time is they have bump music, right? The, the intro music that you hear, mm -hmm. -da -da <laughs> right? And, and everybody who's listening physiologically syncs up to that music. Mm -hmm. You know, our heart rates start to entrain. And, and that's such a wonderful thing because by the time someone starts talking, we're already, you know, within the same heartbeat range. And that's an important factor. I just, I was on a podcast a few minutes ago with a woman who read a study about how a music therapist and their client um, actually can show symbiotic EEG patterns. Wow. And so that you're able to measure and, and report and print out the moment when things all clicked, you know, in the therapy. And, and that's just fascinating stuff. I mean, it, you got to love it. <laughs> wow. I mean, well, you know. <laughs> there's a science, but there's also a way in which, I don't know if you would agree with me, Bill, there's a way in which music touches your soul in a way that I don't think can be quantified by, you know, oh, here's my, my pulse or here's my heart rate. I mean, when I listen to Mozart, I'm, I'm someplace else. I mean, I'm, I'm, being taken almost out of my body. I just love that you went there because I like to think of all of that stuff as sort of spiritual. So here's how it works. Physical, we know what that is. Mental, we know what that is. And emotional, we know what that is. But there's this other thing and you've just identified it. It's like the out of bodiness or the mm. make your skin crawls, right? Or mm. you get chills. So I just call that physical. And or I'm sorry, I just call that spiritual. So anything that falls into that realm, oh my gosh, yes. That's where the soul takes place. And you know, and and you, you get the warm and fuzzy feelings or the stuff that doesn't have an explanation mm. that's scientifically measurable, let's say. And yeah, that's a big part of it. That's That's really, I think, the ultimate because making a connection over music, if you're playing in a band or drumming with somebody or just singing together, which I don't sing, but I've actually, got, <laughs> I've actually sung with an opera star. It's embarrassing, <laughs> but it was live. And, but the, the idea is the connection that comes. Mm -hmm. When you put aside the analytical mind and just focus on being in the moment of the music together, there's nothing like that. I mean, it's, and I, I can say this because it's an NPR audience. In some ways it's better than sex. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny because when I listen to certain um, uh, 
music. I I have this strange observ I don't know what it is, it's not really an observation, but it's like I my my human brain cannot uh I cannot believe how beautiful it is. Like, I don't mm. have words and a mental construct to say, well, this is what they did to make it so beautiful. It, it's yeah. indescribable. It goes beyond my, and I have a pretty good vocabulary, but it goes beyond my ability to explain why it's transporting. Yes, I, I agree with you. The, the um, you know, you can take it apart and theorize about it and and you know that's fun to do but there's just nothing like a great melody mm -hmm. and even when there's no melody at all um, the music can be so transportive I, I a long time ago back in the day when, before fresh air um, there was a thing called um, oh gosh what was the name of the show music from the hearts of space oh i i remember that yeah yeah so i'm listening to that show and the craziest music came on oh, and i found yes. out later it was an album recorded by people who were singing multiple tones at the same time in some crypt in spain <laughs> uh, david hikes hearing solar winds if you're listening and writing it down it's still out there you can still get it i got the lp because this was like in the 70s or something mm -hmm. and talk about music that would put me to sleep I, I could put that album on and wake up like an hour later and just be so incredibly transformed and it's like you were saying there are no words mm -mm. you can't I can't explain no, <laughs> you know and I know this stuff and I can't yeah. explain it <laughs> Hi, Zestful Agers. I'll be attending the International Federation of Aging's 15th Global Conference on Aging in November of 2020. And if you're interested in improving your understanding of age-friendly environments, debating solutions to address inequalities, confronting the reality of ageism, and delving into what it means to enable the functional ability of an older person, head over to ifa2020.org to find out more. There's an early bird special on until the end of the year, so take advantage and join me in Niagara Falls. I'll see you there. So talk to us about how you, you, I mean, you work with the most vulnerable populations. How can we use music to heal? What a fantastic question. You know, I have great respect for my music therapy colleagues. And there's something to be said for the education, the background, and the training that goes into becoming a, a licensed professional, as you know. And because of the need for um, like maintaining a high quality and trust and integrity in that profession, it can only go as fast as the supporting science. So by that, I mean that music therapists are incredibly powerful when it comes to dementia or Alzheimer's or autism. Uh, depression, there's work going on there that's at a clinical level that's just amazing work. But there aren't a lot of music therapists in the world. And I had a therapist say to me one time, way back in the mid 2000s, Bill, there aren't enough therapists. We just, we don't have a way of being able to solve everything that's out there unless people start taking better care of themselves. And that really resonated for me because music saved my life. And I didn't have a therapist available. In fact, at that moment of suicidality, I didn't feel like calling anybody. And I don't know why, but I just put on some music and said, okay, I wanna to listen to this one more time, you know, before it's all mm -hmm. over. And it saved my life. I mean, it, the process of going that deep into that piece of music for me that evening was uh, cathartic. And it, it didn't turn me from a suicidally ideate, ideated, depressed person into some magical, amazingly happy, mm -hmm. you know, person. But it, it gave me practice with meeting suicide head on mm -hmm. and saying, ah, it's you again. And here we are with all of the reasons. And we're going to let them play. I mean, actually let the music play. 
to allow all those reasons to come up and be fully felt in safety before taking any action. So that practice um, has sustained me. Uh, it was sustaining me before and it's sustaining me since. And it seems like every time you practice something, you get another opportunity to go deeper. <laughs> and I have, and you can too. I mean, anybody who wants to engage deeply with music puts themselves directly on the line to healing, whatever it is, mental, emotional, physical, you name it. Mm. You open up to uh, to anything with willingness, it's gonna have an effect on you. May not be the effect that you want, but it will affect you and in very interesting ways that are sustainable ways, not just quick drop in, fix it, go away ways, but things that are life changing. So it, you know what it's like to feel some of the uh the emotions of the population that you work with? I do. So homeless people and at-risk veterans and folks in recovery. The most remarkable thing is all of these people are amazing. And I didn't know this when I first started volunteering, like teaching music to homeless people. I didn't know this, but it's so awesome to work with a population that wants to change. <laughs> right? In my own therapy, I've been, in, I don't know, I'll just spend weeks trying to get to a place where I really want to change or even understand what my issues are. But when you're homeless and you want a house and you know what you have to do in order to make that happen, wow, that's, that's fun because then you're in a place where everything becomes an opportunity. So give us an example. What what does this look like? You do outreach or how, how does this work? Well, music care is about bringing your intention to the music that you love so that it can work on you. Uh, and that usually happens in good ways. But I got to be honest, a lot of music out there is, is scary or angry or sad music. Oh, I was going to ask you about that, actually, the... And I don't want to, you know, get you off track here because I really want to hear how this works with the populations you work with. But the absolute violence of some of the music that I've heard, um, it's frightening. It is frightening, isn't it? Um, and, and, and it needs to be. There, I'm going to use the hip hop culture right now because mm -hmm. in my own personal experience, um, it was ragtime that saved me from giving up the piano at an early age. And thanks to ragtime, I have, I'm still playing. Uh, ragtime is one of those amazing things that didn't come from white Western America, uh, Western Europe. Mm -hmm. And if you start to dig into this a little further, you'll find out that all, all of the really useful music has come from races that in America we oftentimes uh, don't acknowledge fully. Mm -hmm. um, ragtime being one of those things, Scott Joplin, I never knew the guy, didn't even know he existed, started playing ragtime, discovered that there could be joy in music. Because up until that point, classical music had been pretty boring and, you know, difficult and sad and not inspiring. Mm -hmm. So hats off to Scott Joplin and UB Blake and just all the ragtime piano players and then roll it right up to Oscar Peterson and Wynton Marsalis. Mm -hmm. And then let's take it into the hip hop world, which has just taken us by storm. How incredible that we have rap music. So a lot of it's violent. Mm -hmm. But would you rather experience that violence sort of vicariously when a rapper is giving it to you or not have any other way to feel that except to go out and, and break things and hurt people. Mm -hmm. I think rap's giving us a way where we can feel these things without having to act on them and where we can build community around something that may be very difficult to build community around, like the mm -hmm. idea of being oppressed. But we kind of did that with Vietnam in the 60s and you know, why shouldn't we do it now? Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't we be looking to hip hop artists to give us some idea of what it feels like right. you know, to, to come from this place? but not to break things and hurt people to fix it, just to feel it. It's, it's about you know, ex experiencing it. So in, in the work that I do, often I encounter people who are at that hopeless place where they need something, just anything at all to keep them going. And it's difficult to get out of homelessness. It's difficult to be in recovery. Um, it's difficult to sustain those activities, you know, 
there's just to go from homeless to housed in San Diego County is a mm. huge process. Yes, I would imagine. It takes so long. And you're asking someone who's living on the street to be patient. <laughs> and in many cases, people living on the street with some form of mental difficulty, a behavioral health care issue or an addiction to be patient. Oh, how insensitive of, of us, you know, mm -hmm. in one sense. Mm -hmm. So unrealistic. But on the other hand, the people who are living in those in environments are closest to their emotions. That's really one of the things I think that sustains them. And I've had several homeless friends do amazing things and watched other homeless people do incredible work that you would never would have thought was possible. And yet they have. And in one case, uh, a guy dealing with bipolarity was able to help lead and launch a chapter of a nonprofit guitars for vets and that was amazing to watch this guy do that work just it blew me away so i tend to say you know when the homeless people organize look out because they will <laughs> you know they are ready to lead us they've they've been there they've had the experience they're in touch with the feelings that empower their lives and music just is another way of supporting that effort and helping to sustain that crazy situation until it can be changed I've had people in recovery tell me that, and veterans as well. Those are the leaders. When you're broken and blown up and you want to make a step forward, you're going to be leading other people and, and taking them with you on your way to something really incredible. I know I really haven't answered the question about how that works with music, <laughs> but it's so great to work you're with You're so population, inspired right? by them. Oh, it's incredible. It's incredible. And, and it's also very discouraging because nothing happens fast. But to be able to be in an environment where I can lead a music class through an, an hour's process and then have the people at the nonprofit tell me, you know, that music class just changes everybody. The next thing they do after that music class is so amazing and productive. They're different people, <laughs> right? See. And that's great. You know, that's just phenomenal. Ama amazing what it is that a little focus on music can do for you. <laughs> so... Uh, do your students come to a classroom or do you do outreach? How, how does this work? Yeah, it's a good question. So I operate as a for-profit and it looks a little bit like an advisor helping you with a project, if you will. And the project is learning how your music works on you and then being able to adjust your music so that you can do other work with it that you hadn't been doing before. So that can be in a classroom environment or it can be a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I do have an online course so people can do that sort of on their own, but it's a fully mentored, gamified sort of online course. So you're not completely on your own with it. My um, experience has been that helping people who are already in the helping professions add music to their toolkit is a, is a very satisfying way of getting the message out there. Uh, Self-care is such a huge thing right now. And um, with the explosion of cannabis and some other things, people are becoming aware that there are things that we can do for ourselves that are evidence-based and that help. And uh, music, of course, is one. That's my swim lane. But I want to advocate for anyone who's looking at doing a better job of, of caring for themselves when they're not in therapy or not in the hospital or whatever it is. They're tools, they're ways. Uh, we know about yoga and meditation, and by the way, they go together <laughs> for anybody mm -hmm. who's listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We do yoga to quiet our bodies so that we can meditate to quiet our mind. And music is also a holistic practice that way. It, it works on all aspects of us. So uh, those kinds of self-care activities are so necessary right now because we can't all afford an hour of therapy a week even, but we can certainly afford a few minutes a day of something that feeds us and in a useful manner. Uh, that's why homeless people and, and folks who are in recovery and uh, people who are uh, dealing with just severe physical issues or even traumatic ones um, are so responsive to something that they can do on a, on a regular basis, to building a practice in, into their life, whether that's for intervention or for a performance if you're into uh, physical movement or inspiration if that's your line. That music helps there too. So you would uh, work with a person, a student, and to find out what kind of music has a particular effect that they're looking for? Is, is that, yes. you sort of calibrate that? Yeah, it kind of goes that way. So if we were working together, the first thing I'd ask you to do is to, you know, make a list of your top 40. 
Okay. And then after those top 40 songs are there, we look at those and see how they fit into the human ability to resonate for emotions. So it turns out that only about 25% of what we resonate with is joyous, which means we got to look at the other parts <laughs> because you can't stay happy all day long. <laughs> um, you're built to be able to respond to sadness and to fear and to anger. So let's look at your music and see what music is there that supports you fully in those emotions. And if, if it's there, great. If it's not, we find it. And that process of becoming aware of how your music is already working on you opens up the potential for being able to have specific like little snippets, little four song playlists that you can use in a particular um, triggering environment. Road Rage, for example, is one that bugs me all the time. So I've got a couple of songs I use when I'm triggered by Road Rage to let that anger flow through without getting stopped and stuck. Does that make sense? It it does. It's like you're you're syncing up what you're feeling with uh, how the music, as you say, works on you. Yeah. Um, can you share with us what your playlist is? Oh, sure. Um, and it changes all the time. I'm a music hunter, so things that I liked a year ago, well, I still like them, but if they aren't powerful and doing it mm -hmm. for me anymore, I'll change them out. So my rage playlist includes Metallica. Metallica actually is a great one for me to rage to. I know, I've seen the study. There are people who are happy about metal and that's fine. So I'll put that one in there. Um, I, wanna, I wanna take that rage as far as I can in safety. And I really mean that. I, want, I wanna feel like completely enraged. I'm not going to do anything about that. I just want to feel it, you know, and, and a song that gets me there really fast is going to take me there. So Metallica does that well for me. Um, and then after I felt that, I want to sort of dial back and come back to neutral. Mm -hmm. So after, um, I, let's just say Metallica, one of the ones that helps me get back to neutral right now is Lady Madonna from the, oh, that's incredible, the Beatles song. Mm -hmm. And it also ties in, as I'm thinking about this, to uh, the social work that both you and I do with populations we serve. Um, here's this great, upbeat, happy song with these lyrics that are pretty dismal. <laughs> Lady Madonna, baby, your breast, how, how do you expect to feed the rest, right? Mm -hmm. So songs like that help dial it back a little bit. And, and once I've gone up the rage curve, I come back to a more neutral place and I can choose what to feel next once the rage is fully gone. Does that make some kind of sense? It does. I'm thinking about um, doing this in a less scientific way, and I think we all do it. When we're in a particular mood, we choose music to match that. There you go. See, you already, we already know how to do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. It's so important. The, the trouble comes when you try to paper over your mood. Like, let's say I get triggered by somebody who cut me off on the freeway. And if I'm in the right kind of frame of mind and I go to road rage, that's, that's cool. But if I'm not, oh man, again, with the cutting off on the freeway or again with talking on your cell phone and didn't see me or whatever, well, I, I kind of build that up. And at the end of the day, I might be coming home and wanting to just relax, but I still have work to do. I've got to get to the place where I can release that built up anger from earlier in the day. Mm -hmm. So I'll take just a few minutes and intentionally go back to anger to let it, to, to get it out of my system. And then I'm ready to put on the music to change the mood. You know? So it's like you're metabolizing. That's a great word, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, you're processing it. And of course, the science is that, you know, if you, if you can get through a traumatic memory without the, the energy, the energetic stuff that makes trauma hard, um, then you've processed that memory, you sort of digested that memory. Well, this is what music is doing to us, too, as we listen to it. It's allowing us to feel those emotions safely without having to act out on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you have playlists for people um, that you offer them? Or is, that a, is it better done if they choose their own personal playlist? Well, you know, I have collaborative playlists. But I, the research on music is that the music you love is the most powerful. So... It would be, I feel, unethical for me to say, Nicole, listen to this music because <laughs> it will do X. <laughs> right, right, right. Now, we might find together that that's true, but I, I really want to stand behind the science on this because so many of us come from so many different cultures 
that to suggest that Mozart, for example, would work well for uh, people who are used to making music in uh, Africa mm -hmm. uh, is, is the right music. Well, I, maybe not, you know, maybe not. So I'm rather, curious. You know, I was going to say, I'm curious what the research or what your observation is when you pair music with activity, because, you know, my clients will say that they may be getting through a traumatic event or a betrayal, and well, they'll talk about, you know, walking or running is helpful because you're, you're diffusing that intense energy that you speak of. Um, I wonder what it's like to pair the music and running. For example. Yes, this is very powerful. Uh, I know lots of runners who listen to music the whole time or you know, people who work out listening to music the whole time. Uh, provided the music is doing what you want it to, hey, that's great. Um, it'd be difficult for me, I like to mountain bike, so it'd be difficult for me to, to uh, take on a pretty challenging trail listening to you know, very soft, moody, contemplative music. Mm. I mean, it might be nice if I was just cruising and through the forest and not having to pay attention to the rocks that I'm jumping over, whatever. <laughs> but I think I'd choose something that has more of a, uh, it gives me a physiological pop that's, that's higher on adrenaline. Mm -hmm. You know, something that, that gets me in the in activity instead of zoning out. To from match that. it. It yeah. just would be such a mismatch. It would be, wouldn't it? And, and you know what? Okay, so fair, fair question, because one of the homeless guys that I know and, and really love, this guy's amazing, in order for him to dial back from his schizophrenia, he has to put on music that many of us would find impossible to listen to. But, you know, scream metal or something will bring him down to where he can function normally. Unbelievable. Is, is it crazy? so interesting. <laughs> I don't know where the research is on that stuff, but I suppose one of these days we'll have it. In, in the, and in the meantime, we've got, you know, anecdotal evidence, that at least for one guy, that's useful. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, my goodness. It, it really makes you wonder about all these systems. You know, I keep using the word syncing up, but that, you know, it mirrors his inner experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, he introduced me, I, I had heard about these, but he introduced me to binaural beats. Do you know about binaural beats? I, tell me, I don't, I don't think so. Let me get the spelling, B-I-N, mm -hmm. bin, binary, and aural, A-U-R-A-L, I believe. So a binaural beat is, um, is how piano tuners tune the piano. When you have two strings that are close to the same pitch, and you can do this on a guitar or anything too if you want to try it, they sound the same note, but they're off by just enough to make a sort of wah, 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 wah sound happen. Um, if you've ever flown on a twin propeller airplane, as, they're, as the two engines are reaching the same exact same RPM, you can hear that sort of wah, wah, wah going on. Mm. And this, okay. this binaural beat occurs in nature. A, a bunch of crickets chirping make binaural beats. And what's happened is the, the sound is the same coming from each cricket, but the, it's slightly out of phase. So you get a slight dip in the sound. Instead of being continuous, you'll hear a wah, 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 wah. And that is a binaural beat. The cool thing about binaural beats is that they, they uh, how do I say this? They help our, our systems, our human systems, in train around a particular frequency. And you know, there's marketing on this now where they have binaural beats for headaches and binaural beats for waking up in the morning and binaural, they have binaural beats for everything. And they're very specific frequencies. And um, you've heard of theta waves and beta waves and alpha waves and all of that mm -hmm. brain wave stuff. Well, there's a lot of them that play into those wave forms. And, and we can actually entrain ourselves to a specific frequency that's useful for th thinking or useful for activity or useful for sleep or useful for healing. And um, more about this at brainwave.com if anybody wants to see it. It's not my site, but it's great for binaural beats and you can get them on your phone and I use them. It, it sort of pulls all of the melody out of sound and just leaves you with the essence of the beat, of the tension and release, tension and release. Mm -hmm. And it's a great way to start to approach your particular resonancy with different frequencies of sound. Uh, I don't know if this is similar, Bill. It could be way off, but I'm 
uh, aware of this whole idea of fractal shapes in nature. Oh, yes. Different versions of the same shapes that really speak to our brain in a way that is both stimulating but manageable and um, sort of stimulating but calming in the same way. And um, it sounds in some ways... It sounds in some ways like similar to what you're saying is that there are different versions of the same element. And I don't know if, if that's right, but you're talking about like the crickets chirping. Yeah, crickets, um, waves on the beach. Mm -hmm. I, I love that rabbit hole. Um, I have this idea <laughs> that the, the visual thing that we see is fractals, uh, the Fibonacci sequence, all of that. They all point back to something that's bigger and perhaps not in the same dimension that all of us are in. But I think emotion may be the gateway that lets us understand um, how those shapes matter to us. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to connect the science on that, except that to say that there are people doing research in what's called quantum gravity now. And uh, they have found a mathematical way to explain everything in the universe. It's just not as easy as we thought, and it doesn't have to do with string theory. But this idea of returning to basics to find out how it all works, mm -hmm. that's kind of the pathway that I've taken with the binaural beats um, thought line. And I think that you're taking with the, the fractals in nature yes. thought line. I think we've, if we get back to those really basic things, we're closer to what, what it really is, you know, as opposed to getting all caught up in the science of how complicated things can be. It's much simpler at the end of the day, you know. Um, kaleidoscopes are a great way of visually getting an in on this. It's been a long time since anybody handed me a kaleidoscope, but they're fascinating. You can get them online. You know, mm -hmm. you can watch a kaleidoscope go on your screen and it's mesmerizing <laughs> in a good it way. It really is. You know, that, that's, I don't hesitate to say this, but that seems to me to be one way in to a deeper understanding or practice of self-care, as crazy as it sounds. I mean, we, we were given those things for a reason, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's use them. Yeah, that's that's some intense stuff right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you still um, performing? I do. Um, I have this fantastic opportunity to play with a couple of veterans who are in recovery. Uh, both of them have been homeless on more than one occasion. Uh, they're both sober. And this is a band that got started years ago. And the leader went up, went back on the street after being in recovery. We lost track of him forever. And I was so pleased. It was the best birthday present I've ever had, Nicole, because I walked into this recovery center where I volunteer. And there he was coming toward me. And it's like, oh, my gosh, mm. you're, you're, you're alive. Oh. <laughs> so definitely. And is it the greatest band in the world? Who cares? We get to make music, and people like it. <laughs> uh. So I do, and and um, I have for a long time. I've been on a hiatus with my one man show, but I feel like it's time to bring that back. I think it's it's time again to revive uh, the show that I call Connected, and to do that more widely. Because uh, I first of all, I miss being in front of audiences at the piano. Even though it's fun to talk to people, it's even more fun to play. So I miss that, and it's time to do that again. And to do that sort of cooperatively and collaboratively uh, with people, one of the aspects of the show is I get everybody to kazoo together. So <laughs> making music together is just, it's where it's at. That's, that's really the point of healing right there. Mm -hmm. So you're doing a lot of different things. I, I do. I, I try to stay in my swim lane with music. But as you mentioned earlier, the, the book about practical spirituality kind of came as a result of my volunteer work. And... I got to do another book about uh, homeless people, uh, drawings of homeless people done years ago by a friend who's an artist. We published that and um, we've been using that as a gratitude initiative and giving them to agencies that have done exemplary work with homelessness uh, just to spark up this idea of being grateful for just a thankless job. I mean, anybody who's in the social services industries right now is just buried. It, yeah. There's not enough money. There's too much to do. And uh, we need to change that paradigm too. So I do get involved in advocating for um, folks who are looking how to change, how to scale the not-for-profit industry so that we can solve some of these problems, you know, instead of just, instead of having them be so expensive with so little results. Uh, th there are ways. 
there are ways to do it. And so uh, what, what's a typical day for you look like? <laughs> These days, I'm spending a lot of time on podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I am looking to empower people who are already doing the work with new tools. And, and I think music care is one of those tools. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking to be able to, um, to help the experts do what they do in a, in a bigger, better way. And if music can be of any use in that space, uh, those are the people I want to talk to. Because I'm just one person and getting the word out, you can do it online, but to be successful online, you have to be the noisiest. And I'm not a very noisy guy. <laughs> I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm more about melody and harmony and uh, competing in the social media noise. It's not going to help. It, it just adds to the problem instead of helping create the solution or offer people tools that they can use to create the solution. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe now's a good time to ask you where people can learn more about music care and your work. Well, it's easy to Google music care and you'll find out, um, musiccare.net is a site that I manage, but a bigger sort of easier way in is at practicalheartskills.com, practicalheartskills.com. Okay. And we'll put them in the show notes. And you can Google me, you'll find me all over the place out there. Um, I don't sit behind a paywall. I, I need to be able to help people who are doing what they do, do things better. So if you encounter a place where you're being asked for money, it's it's either one specific course that's online that you can take from me quest.musiccare.net so that is one paywall although mm -hmm. that course is free to veterans and military uh, active duty um, i have a real heart for that and uh, i'm happily able to take what i'm earning in the in the for-profit world and offer that opportunity to veterans and military garden reserves if you're out there um, no paywall for you to come through the course it's too important it really is. Just learn this stuff and, and use it. It's so, so important. Mm -hmm. That's such a gift. Thank you. It's been really wonderful talking to you, Bill. I feel like, you know, we could talk for hours and about all these kind of metaphysical things and also just, you know, you're talking about the importance of helping people and, and how that really is your passion and what drives you and I want to say thank you for your work. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for acknowledging that. <laughs> I, I have to reciprocate because I know that you do work in this same sector and gratitude is, is so, uh, I don't know, it's so stingy. So Nicole, thank you mm. for all that you've brought to the people who you know, deserve it the most and are often the least served. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on Zestful Aging. If you like the podcast, please share it with some of your friends. I love to hear from my listeners. Send me an email at NicoleChristina.com. In this phase of our lives, we're more aware that our time is precious, and we certainly don't want to waste it taking care of stuff that we no longer need, left over from a life that we are no longer living. We know we would feel better with less clutter and more open space, but we don't know how to get there. If this sounds familiar, I'd love you to check out the online course I've developed with professional organizer and designer, Carrie Luteran. This course is different than others you may have tried because we give you clear steps to deal with the clutter and tools to help you face the overwhelm and feelings that come up when you're going through your clutter. It's practical and realistic, and the lessons are short and punchy and very manageable, but it has the power to change your life. We all deserve to live in a peaceful home without the chaos of too much stuff. Find out more at NicoleChristina.com. Next week, we're going to be speaking with Melissa Burton, who is an Academy Award winner for short documentary. She did a beautiful piece of film on menstrual justice called Period, End of Sentence. It is absolutely fascinating, and it is streaming on Netflix if you want to take a look. 
period, end of sentence. We'll be speaking with her next week, so stay tuned. See you then.